Hello everybody, my name is Geert van der Snicht and I work for the Access Research Group of the Department of Chemistry for the University of Antwerp. I will talk about the potential of macro X-ray fluorescence scanning as an analytical imaging tool for studying stained glass windows. I gave this presentation earlier in real life during the Technar 2015 conference in Sicily. But before we take off, I would like to take a minute to acknowledge my co-authors, first of all, PhD student Stan Legrand, who did most of this work, glass conservator Joost Kahn, who helped with the interpretation of the results, Frederik van Meert, who did some calculations, Professor Koen Janssens, who is the head of our group and the mastermind behind all of this, and finally, uh, Matthias Alfeld, who built the instrument and developed the software during his PhD. Uh, the research that we talk about here today was supported by the IMBEF Bayer Latour Fund. The macro XRF scanning instrument was originally developed for characterization of easel paintings, as you can see here. I discussed the advantages of this recent technique during the Technart conference in 2013, which took place in Amsterdam. The elemental distribution maps produced by the scanner allow to identify and visualize the painting materials, an aspect that can be also employed for finding pigments that have been discolored. For the case of the sunflowers, we were particularly interested in degraded germanium lake and chrome yellow, a topic that has been extensively ex investigated by my colleague Letizia Monico. The most spectacular application is, however, the visualiz visualization of overpainted compositions and pentimenti that become apparent in the images, even in cases when conventional X-ray radiographies or infrared reflectographies are not very informative, as you can see here. All of this received a lot of attention, and as a result, we started to wonder which other objects besides easel paintings can be scanned. There are some limitations, though. As the setup was created for two-dimensional paintings, the object of interest has to present a flat surface to measure. The first thing that pops to mind are illuminated manuscripts, as these are basically paintings on a paper or on a parchment substrate. For that, we traveled around with our scanner. We visit the Royal Library in the Netherlands, which is close to Antwerp, the Getty Museum in LA, which is also close to Antwerp, and the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is a little bit further away. Results on the latter campaign have been presented during the Technart conference as well. Another type of object that resembles a painting to a certain extent are stained glass windows. By coincidence, there is quite some expertise in our research group on glass analysis. In the last decade, books were published, PhD research was done, and various, various articles were published by colleagues of mine. But we, before we embark on scanning experiments on windows, it's probably useful to figure out how stained glass windows are usually analyzed. In literature, a large number of techniques have been reported, but the most popular methods are clearly XRF, which is good news for us, and SEM-EDX. Now, what all of these techniques have in common is the fact that they involve analysis on samples or small fragments. Most of these articles focus on the technique itself or on the results obtained, but none of them mention how difficult it can be to collect a consistent set of samples. Most stained glass windows are found in their architectural setting, so if you want to collect samples, you have to first overcome your afraid of heights to remove the panels from the masonry. Next, in the studio, you have to cut open the LED game network so you can reach the glass and fragments of interest, and then a number of nasty tools such as glass cutters, diamond saws, tongs and tweezers come into play. All of them are instruments that we do not associate with the words non-destruction or non-invasive words that we like so much. Finally, the samples are embedded in resin and polished in cross-section and analyzed. After you did all of that work, the final result consists of a table like this that shows the weight percentages of the different glass components from, let's say, six to eight samples. Still, one has to raise the question how relevant or representative the compositional results are for an entire stained glass windows. 
The samples in this resin are 8 times a square millimeter approximately, which means that you missed out the remaining 35 million of square millimeters. Knowing all of this, it's not surprising that a number of authors have reported their efforts to perform analysis directly on stained glass panels in a non-invasive way. Still, these are mainly point analysis. For that reason, in this work, we assess the capability of microXRF scanning to collect compositional data from the entire surface from a stained glass panel and in a non-invasive way. To do so, we scanned three uh, windows stemming from three completely different technological eras. For this talk, I only have time to cover the results obtained on one glass panel. The panel is part of a very beautiful ensemble that depicts St. George and St. Michael. It was probably produced for the chapel of the Guild of St. Luke in Bruges and is now part of the collection of the City Museum in Bruges. The panels were dated around 1490 and it is important to know that the end of the 15th century is a period of transition in the Low Countries. First of all, Renaissance arrives, which means that stained glass panels start to look different from a stylistic point of view. Also, there is a shift in the way that glass is blown, from crown to cylinder technique, and finally also the composition changes. The potash type is abandoned in favor of what is often called high lime, low alkali glass. Potash glass is basically sand with three ashes, while, lime, while, while high lime, low alkali glass is sand and three ashes with an excess of lime. Here you see the parameters that we use to measure this panel of about 57 by 58 centimeters, resulting in a total scan time of approximately 24 hours. However, stained glass windows are similar to easel paintings, but they are not entirely the same. Before we started scanning, I first asked myself the question, in what way they are different and what the consequences would be for the experiments. When I was thinking about this in my office, I was looking outside of my window and the answer suddenly appeared. This guy showed up, the window cleaner, and all of a sudden I realized that he has to clean windows both from the outside as the inside. So this means that we might have to scan stained glass windows also from two sides. Is that a relevant question you might ask? Well it is, and that becomes clear if you know how a stained glass window is built up. A stained glass window consists of a set of glass panes that can be colorless or colored. Col color colorless glass is often made of a network former, silicium dioxide, soda or potassium based alkalis as fluxing agent and a network stabilizer such as lime. Colored glass is made by introducing metal oxides into the batch in an oxidizing or reducing environment. There are two, two production methods, pot metal glass and flushed glass. Pot metal glass is col colored throughout the entire thickness of the glass, while flesh glass is produced by applying a thin stratum of colored glass on a thicker layer of colorless glass. Here you already notice that it will be important on which side of the glass the X-ray source and detector are positioned. Next, uh, vitreous glass panes are fired onto the panes to realize trace lines and shadows. These so-called grisaille panes are basically a low melting glass to which semi-opaque grains of metal oxides are added that reflect incident light. You see the granular structure clearly in this backscattered electron image. Grisaille is predominantly applied to the, onto the interior side although sometimes details are painted on the exterior side as well. A special type of glass paint is yellow silver stain. Silver ions diffuse into the glass and it is completely transparent and always applied to the exterior side. Finally, there is also sanguine and enamels, but I will not talk about these paints as, do, as they do not occur in this window. The glass windows are joined together by lead games which are soldered together with a lead-thin alloy. 
Finally, the space in between the LED profiles and the glass is filled up with putty that consists of chalk and linseed oil. After some time, weathering crusts can be formed. Corrosion crusts are formed by an ion exchange between the uh, hydrogen ions in water that is deposited on the glass surface and calcium or potassium ions that are leached out of the glass. The latter can react with sulfur from the atmosphere, forming gypsum or oxalate crusts. Corrosion crusts occur on the exterior side, but can also be found on the interior side and can also affect glass panes. Alternatively, pit corrosion can occur due to water condensation on the inside. The reasons for analysis focus on the study of these components and related conservation issues. However, literature pays particularly attention to distinguishing different types of glass, um, different uh, types of glass panes for dating and provenance purposes. This is basically done by quantifying the network former, the fluxing agent, and the stabilizers, and results in schemes like this one. Looking at this scheme, it becomes clear that the uh, position of the measuring head they will depend on the aspect that you want to study. The question if macro XRF experiments are useful for stained glass windows will be answered by its capability to make a differentiation between glass types. I will focus on this aspect in the next few slides. St. Michael is a good case, as it was well studied by connoisseurs and because two samples have been analyzed by SEM EDX, which can serve as a benchmark. The first sample was extracted from colorless glass and identified as potassium glass. You see in the table that it is rich of potassium. The second sample is blue and identified as high lime, low alkali glass. Unfortunately, quantification is not possible by macroxrf scanning because we are measuring in ambient air. As a result, the low energy signal from the low Z elements is largely, uh, largely absorbed by air molecules on its path to the detector. In addition, surface effects are expected as we are not measuring on a polished surface and LED games will cast shadows. The distance between the detector and the glass surface is not stable as stained glass panels are never flat but curved and also we are operating at very short acquisition times. The main question is thus if the signal from these elements here will give us enough information. The most informative elements will be potassium and calcium. So let's have a look at their distribution images. Looking at the distribution of calcium and potassium, we clearly see differences in intensities between the different pieces of glass. The colorless potash glass from which sample 1 was extracted seems to yield a relatively high potassium intensity. It is white in the image, or relatively white, while other pieces are poor in potassium. They look dark or black in the image. The blue high, uh, the blue high lime low alkali sample is indeed taken from a glass piece that is rich in calcium, so the distribution images seem, do seem to make sense. However, you will agree that we need a better and a more statistical way of looking at this data. We can do this because we have a three-dimensional data cube. In other words, behind each pixel in the distribution image is an XRF spectrum that tells us the net intensities of potassium and calcium. When we plot these intensities in a scatter plot, different clouds or elemental ratios become apparent. Just by the eye, we can discern four groups. The first group is particularly rich in potassium and poor in calcium. It is safe to assume that this is potassium glass or potash glass. 
when we give the dots in the graph a green color and relate this back to the graph, you will notice that the dots are not scattered all over the place, but appear to agree with specific glass pieces. Most of the glass seems to be of the potash glass type, and this corroborates with the earlier connoisseurship dating. Please remember that our colorless potash glass sample was taken in this specific area. So that seems to make sense. Upon taking a closer look to this cloud, you see that there might be a second subgroup of potash glass. If we give this a pinkish color, a number of glass pieces show up uh, and they have a purplish color. Um, this seems to match the, brick, the, the glass pieces with the brick uh, wall motif. Interestingly, connoisseurs uh, have marked a number of these pieces as well by visual inspection and formulated the hypothesis that these might be part of a very early conservation treatment. Let us now have a look to the other side of the spectrum. If we give a red color to the cloud that presents the highest calcium and the lowest potassium intensity, we see that this group confers with the red glass pieces. We can consider these as high lime, low alkali glass. It matches the red glass pieces, as you can see here. A second subgroup of high lime, low alkali glass can be discerned. When we give this a blue color, you see that it matches the blue glass pieces. Remember that our second sample was taken from the blue glass and that it was indeed identified as high lime, low alkali glass by the electron microscope analysis. A last group is related with the green claw of the dragon. And that is resting on the shield of the saint. Remarkably, the other green glass is part of a different group. It was identified as potash glass earlier. So the green glass of the claw seems to be a special kind of green, and that will be confirmed later in this presentation. In summary, we have a late 15th century window that consists mainly of potash glass and some high lime low alkali glass, an outcome which has been reported in literature before. In particular, the colorless and the pot metal glass appears to be of the potash type, while the most expensive and sophisticated glass, the red, the blue and the special green, is of the high lime, low alkali type. The potassium-calcium ratio seems to vary with the color of the glass. Are there any problems with this technique? Yes, there are. You might have noticed that a number of glass pieces contain several colors in the image. These are the pieces that are affected by glass corrosion. As the surface of the glass is enriched with potassium and calcium in the crusts, the correlation will be messed up. The presence of corrosion also shows up in the distribution image, in particular in the sulfur image, the calcium and the potassium. All of this means that this technique will not work for other glass panels that are heavily affected by glass corrosion. Another problem that can occur is the insertion of old glass pieces during a conservation treatment. If modern soda-based glass is used to replace missing glass pieces, this will clearly show up in the scans. However, if the missing pieces are replaced by historical pieces that were recuperated from old windows, the interpretation will become quite difficult. Here this is the case for a limited number of pieces and the intervention was fortunately documented. Apart from that, one could raise the question if the variable thickness of the glass is not causing the variation in the intensity of the signal that we see in the correlation plots. From an XRF point of view, the question is, can we consider the glass as a sample with an infinite thickness? This seems to be the case. It is possible to calculate the maximum depth from which the detected signal can, be, can originate. As you can see, this depends on a number of parameters related to the source, detector and the geometry. 
Being a low Z element, the potassium signal is very surface related. But heavier elements like rubidium and strontium produce fluorescence with a higher energy that then can come from circa 1.7 mm in a silicium oxide matrix. Stained glass from this period is always thicker than 2 mm, it's rather 3 mm, and thus we can conclude that the thickness of the glass has no influence on the results presented. Apart from the potassium and the calcium, we can also look at other elements and see if we can use them for differentiation. As you know, the light elements, the light elements are out of question. But in contrast, XRF has better detection limits for the heavier elements in comparison with the electron microscope. This graph shows that for XRF scanning, uh, we are in the 10 to 100 ppm range for the heavier elements, while for SEM-EDX, this is rather in the 1000 ppm range. What does that mean? Well, that means that we can detect trace elements with our XRF scanner that cannot be picked up with the electron microscope. An example of this is the strontium and the rubidium mentioned before. You see a clear variation in the elemental distribution images, which looks promising. Also here we can make a correlation plot. And give colors to the different groups. This results in an image that looks almost exactly the same as the calcium versus potassium plot. So the same types can be differentiated. Only the green claw is missing. This is good news as the data from strontium and rubidium is not significantly affected by superimposed corrosion products, as was the case for the calcium versus potassium plot. We still need to have a look at the colorants in the glass. Here you see the distribution image of copper recorded on the exterior side of the panel. The green glass from the wings and clothing clearly shows up. If we look at the same image recorded from the interior side, you see that copper is present in the same glass pieces. This indicates that pot metal glass was used, glass that is colored throughout its entire thickness and thus equally detected on both sides of the glass. However, in contrast, the red glass shows up in the interior image, but not in the exterior image. This indicates that flashed glass was used with a colored copper rich layer on the interior side, as illustrated by this scheme. Another strange feature that becomes clear, the green claw of the dragon does not contain any copper, as expected. So it must be colored in a different but unconventional way. Please keep this in mind for the next slide. The blue glass is also pot metal glass, as becomes clear from the interior and exterior map of cobalt. Interestingly, the green claw of the dragon seems to be rich in cobalt, an element that is usually used for obtaining blue colors. A possible explanation could be the combination of blue glass with a yellow paint. When you look at the distribution of silver, you see that all the yellow areas are colored by means of silver stain. However, not the claw. For the moment, the claw remains a mystery, which can only be solved by means of taking a sample. But even though we cannot explain this completely, the fact that we now know that there is something enigmatic about the green claw is a striking result. Because until now, nobody noticed, in spite of the fact that it's a well-studied window. It gives an idea about the potential of microxerf scanning for revealing new information. And so we reach the conclusions. The scan technique allows collecting compositional data from the entire surface in a non-destructive way, while conventional analysis involves taking samples and yields information only from a number of points. The scans do take a long time, but these are relatively effortless in comparison with sam edx which requires a relatively labor-intensive sample preparation. Although quantification is not possible and no information is collected on light elements, it appeared feasible to differentiate several types of glass within the same panel. This is possible by producing correlation plots of calcium versus potassium and strontium versus rubidium. 
the ensuing differentiation was confirmed by previous electron microscope analysis and connoisseur connoisseurship data. On the downside, heavy corrosion can affect the correlation of calcium versus potassium or when historical glass pieces were inserted during previous conservation treatments. Apart from that, it was possible to distinguish pot metal glass from flash glass without taking the glass panel apart. Vitreous glass panes were nicely visualized and the same can be said for corrosion products and cracks and organic glues. These show up in the continuum image because they scatter the X-rays in a more, ef more effectively than the glass. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you for your attention and I hope to meet you on a future conference.